this, this evening. Um, this is a talk about a very, um, um, I would say, pioneering uh, experiment in, in urban development, uh, not only in Saudi Arabia, but in, in the entire Middle East. And I would say probably, you know, um, in any of the new nation states that uh, emerged out after the Second World War. Uh, I've been asked by the AIA Middle East to um, leave this note about the learn learning objectives of, of, this, uh, of this webinar. Uh, but for me personally, I'm be very so looking forward to your uh, uh, input, feedback, and comments about you know, the process that I'll be discussing with you tonight. Uh, it's a very long journey for Khobar, uh, which will, I will try to compress in, in about 45 uh, minutes. The simple question uh, that this webinar would be asking is, uh, if nobody knows uh, what uh, Khobar is, it's a, it's a city in the Eastern province, uh, which has been designed from scratch in 1947, uh, based on a grid iron uh, scheme um, from A to Z. And we will be discussing you know, the birth of this scheme, the growth of it, and the demise uh, and probably the future uh, of, of Khobar um, uh, urban plan that was established in 1947. Um, we'll go through a time journey of how this was conceived, how it developed, and then uh, how it is today and what it might be uh, in, the, in the future. Before we jump to Khobar, I think it's very important to um, learn a little bit about like, what was the urban situation uh, around the time uh, after the Second World War um, in Saudi Arabia, around the time when Khobar was planned in 1947. Uh, you might be uh, surprised, I was, <laughs> uh, that most so big Saudi cities that we know now uh, were still within their uh, city walls. Uh, Riyadh in 19, uh, it didn't, uh, I mean, the, the, the city wall of Riyadh, for instance, was not removed until 1950. Hufuf, which is the largest urban center close to Khobar in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, was still uh, inside its own medieval city walls until 1951. Jeddah, which is a major urban uh, metropolis today, um, had its uh, city wall removed only in 1947. Uh, by that time, it was still, you know, deeply rooted in its own heritage with its own city wall and gates and its urban fabric was still very, um, very um, rooted in, in its own traditional heritage. Um, there was no practice of urban planning, I would say. I mean, that, that's like the, the conclusion uh, until, until the 1950s, there, were, there was no practice of urban planning professional urban planning in, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, population movement is extremely important. Um, the, the earliest um, data we have, like correct data, is as early as 1960s. But you could interpolate you know, from this data that, in fact, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, from the 1960s and before, had more rural population than its uh, uh, urban population, which only exceeded the rural population only in the 1970s. Uh, right now, of course, most of the Saudi Arabia uh, population or the majority of the population would be living in, the, in, in, a, in a golden axis, so, so to speak, you know, that is you know, connecting Dammam, Riyadh, and, and Jeddah. About 65 to 70% of the Saudi population right now lives in these big regions. Uh, north and south of that uh, would be um, smaller towns or rural population. But when Khobar was planned, most of Saudi Arabia's population was still living in, um, in, in rural or, or, or nomadic you know, uh, settings. Um, to, um, you know, to zoom uh, into the, the region where, where Khobar was conceived, um, at that time, the only or the major uh, uh, population centers were on Katif, that is much closer to Khobar, and Hufuf in the hinterland of the eastern province in the middle of the desert, which was an oasis. Um, around, you know, there were, and when we say the major uh, uh, population centers, we are talking about 30,000 to 50,000 uh, population each 
uh, between Katif and Hufuf, the rest of the population would be nomadic, uh, uh, nomadic population roaming around the desert. Uh, and uh, probably, you know, uh, during the winter, they would go to the desert and uh, during the summer, they would retreat to the oases of uh, Katif uh, and Hufuf. The economic base was extremely um, limited at that time. It's pre-industrial uh, economy. Uh, Katif, which was uh, the, a major port on the on the on the Gulf, um, had about you know by around like around twenty to thirty thousand of population by the you know the by the nineteen thirties or nineteen forties. It was historically a major. Um, a major uh, port on the on the Arabian Gulf. Um, you might be uh, you might find it interesting that uh, uh, um, Italian sailors or uh, navigators called you know the Gulf or the part of the Gulf that is close to Katif, Mari el Katif, as you see here in one of these fifteenth um, sixteenth uh, century maps by um, Italian uh, cartographers. Um, a lot of stratified heritage actually uh, took place in Katif. Uh, it's a city with very old heritage, thousands of years, uh, which is much closer you know, to the desert, uh, away from the Arabian Gulf, uh, was another major city, uh, a medieval town, uh, very important because of its um, palm uh, tree uh, agriculture. Um, it was still traditional city within its city walls um, until you know the magic touch of oil uh, was starting you know to give its fruits uh, in 1933 Saudi Arabia uh, signed uh, an agreement with the standard oil of California uh, SoCal uh, and you could you could see here actually Mr. Lloyd Hamilton the, the president of uh, uh, Standard Oil of California with Mr. Ben Suleiman, the, um, the finance minister of Saudi Arabia in 1933, signing this agreement in, in Jeddah. In fact, this picture was taken in Jeddah. Um, and that agreement, uh, with that agreement, the, 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 the accelerated wheel of change uh, kicked off uh, from 1933 almost to 1938. Uh, Standard Oil of California um, was looking for oil, uh, mostly without uh, success. Uh, the, the year after the signing the, the agreement in 1934, Dahran, which was completely unoccupied, a uh, piece of desert, um, had its first camp that you could, I'm, I'm, I hope you can see it here, you know, under the yellow arrow. And um, uh, immediately, you know, the American... Um, um, engineers and technicians and geologists um, poured to, to Dahran to look for oil. And this process started um, until 1938. Um, you could see here, you know, like signs of this change. In fact, it's very interesting to see how the change actually translates, you know, socially. Uh, it was the, you know, the meeting point of these two seemingly divergent uh, cultures, you know, the, the North American uh, culture with, with, with the local uh, Arab culture. Nasr al-Ajmi, for instance, was, was a small boy when he joined Aramco, was a small Bedouin boy. He never had seen a car ever in his life, life or, or a truck at that time, according to him in his own memoirs. Uh, but you could see him here, uh, who became a vice president of Aramco at a later stage in his life. Um, you know, embracing, you know, the, the, the new change. Max Steinecke, the, the person in the lower picture, uh, is, is the very famed geologist who actually found oil in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, appearing like uh, a, a tribal uh, chief in, in his Arabian clothes. Um, although these pictures, you know, may be taken, you know, for, you know, for, um, you know, for the, um, uh, I would say, you know, for like social uh, reasons, but, you know, they, they, they give you an, uh, uh, an indication of the amount of change uh, that was taking place in a, in, a, in, in a place that was still deeply rooted in its century old uh, tradition. Uh, in terms of urbanization uh, or human settlement, uh, 
um, Dammam was a very, which is the closest site to Khobar, uh, was very small fishing village, probably not more than 1,500 uh, citizens there. Uh, the only landmark it had at that time was the Dammam Castle, which was later, uh, you know, demolished. Um, Khobar itself, I don't know if you could see Khobar uh, here. Uh, this is the, the coastal line of the, of the Gulf. And Khobar would be somewhere in here. And I think you could see it if you, um, um, yeah, if you focus closely on the picture. It was a very, very small, I would say, hamlet of fishermen, um, huts that are made of um, uh, palm tree uh, straws, uh, palm tree fronds that were brought uh, all the way from Katif. And I don't, the, num the population at that time in 1935 was estimated to be only around 75 uh, residents in these huts in the site that became later on Khobar. So it was not, I don't think it was a permanent uh, settlement, but it was probably uh, um, a seasonal settlement that uh, fishermen coming from Khatif or Hufuf or other places would act simply, um, uh, uh, simply, you know, um, uh, take hold of these, um, uh, of these huts during the fishing season. Um, between 33, the date of signing the agreement, into, until 1938, um, there was no much um, uh, oil, you know, in, in commercial quantities. Uh, a few wells were discovered, but they didn't have enough, um, uh, enough quantities, you know, to be uh, commercially um, feasible until 1938, when the first uh, uh, commercial uh, oil well was discovered in Dharan. It's called the Mam Number no. Seven, uh, one of seven wells that were uh, drilled, and one of them had commercial quantities. Um, the um, lifeline of Dharan field at that time, from 33 up until 1939, was its connection with Bahrain. Uh, Standard Oil of California already started exploration and, and, and pro production of crude oil in Bahrain uh, probably 10 years before. Uh, so the Standard Oil base in Bahrain was actually um, uh, communicating and supporting the Dahran base in Saudi Arabia through building the, um, you know, the first uh, makeshift uh, uh, port in Khobar. It's called Al Khobar Port or Fordat Al Khobar in Arabic. Uh, and it was like uh, actually handmade, you know, by, uh, by, by like Aramco laborers and, and, and technicians. And uh, it was the, this small, very small port uh, was able to receive uh, equipment and material from Bahrain and also um, export or transport crude oil to Bahrain for refining because there were no facilities you know, of uh, oil uh, uh, refining in Saudi Arabia until 1939. From that day or from, you know, during those few years, Khobar became important as a logistic hub. Uh, as small as it was, it was still important as a logistic hub for receiving equipment and material and transporting them 15 minutes away, you know, by car to Dahran and taking crude oil, you know, and sending it to Bahrain for, um, um, for uh, refining. Um, what was the situation in Saudi Arabia then? then? I mean, um, uh, the, the, the sources for those people who are interested in, in doing extra research are extremely limited. Uh, uh, but you could find them in secondary sources like, you know, journals, uh, um, personal memoirs, and, 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 and the like. And in this uh, National Geographic uh, uh, article of 48, um, uh, there was an article uh, that was written about, you know, the, the Eastern province and especially, you know, the oil exploration uh, life uh, and heritage uh, and how Saudi Arabia was and how it became at that time. And it's very interesting, you know, to see even the, the editorial uh, attempt, you know, by uh, the National Geographic to, to give an image of what this land is and what it became uh, in this picture that you see here on the left of a truck 
uh, traversing you know the desert and it, it, uh, the caption reads that this this American truck is in fact um, much easier to to navigate you know the desert than than a, a camel and it needs uh, less to drink than um, you know it needs less to drink uh, between rides you know th than a camel um, uh, until then even until the 1940s you know a camel was the means of travel uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, the, the, the upper picture is, is of uh, a class room uh, of uh, school children uh, of Aramco expats in, uh, in Dahran, and they were learning about, uh, from the same issue of uh, National Geographic, about this new land, and they got this little deer or gazelle uh, with them. Um, the, the, the conclusion or the, um, the, the morale of the story is that still even the um, you know the company which is the major uh, developer in the eastern province at that time uh, was looking at this as an extremely um, uh, I would say uh, foreign land uh, extremely um, uh, different um, uh, different than what they probably have uh, uh, back home but this was not actually, uh, we'll talk about it later, uh, this attitude of um, looking at this land from distance, uh, because it's very important, you know, when conceiving uh, an urbanization plan, you know, for a city like Khobar. Um, uh, an economist uh, from the American University, University of Beirut visited uh, the Eastern province in the early 50s, uh, and uh, he made um, an analysis of the local enterprise and growth of business uh, in the eastern province, especially in Khobar and Dahran. And uh, his conclusion was that this, this cultural framework is something that belongs with its economic base, of course, and cultural base, it's something that belongs to the 15th century. And it got this new industry uh, superimposed on it that came from the 20th century. So, so there was, according to his statement, Richard Farmer, uh, about 500 years of, of um, difference between um, what this place is and how it accelerated uh, into, the, um, into the oil industry uh, era. Um, before I talk about uh, di um, directly about you know, the planning of Khobar, uh, there were different experiments before uh, in the eastern province, you know, before actually taking the decision uh, to establish uh, Khobar uh, as a city. And that is the uh, Rastan Noura, that is uh, a refinery about an hour drive to the north of Dharan uh, right now. And uh, for Aramco, because of the increase in, in, in commercial oil production in the year before, 1938, uh, Aramco wanted to have its own refinery, just like Papco's refinery in, in Bahrain. And this is what they did. They did that in Rastanura because that was the um, only uh, place on the Gulf that is closer to the to Dahran that would um, um, accommodate, you know, very uh, large, you know, oil tankers. Um, but the the if you look at the, um, the the picture here, the aerial picture. The, the way the Rastan Nora was zoned is going to be critical for, uh, for to, um, uh, sorry about my phone here. Um, it's going to be critical for, um, for zoning uh, uh, the Mam and the Haran later on. So in 1933, you could see at the picture here, uh, King Abdelaziz inaugurating the, the first shipment of uh, Saudi crude oil uh, from Rastan Noura. Uh, with him here is uh, Floyd Oliger, uh, the Aramco president. Um, according to, to Aramco records, he's one of the people who are credited you know, for establishing all of these urban codes uh, that uh, uh, were established in, in, in the Eastern province, in Dahran, in, in Khobar uh, especially. And we will talk a little bit about him later, Floyd Oliger. Uh, Rastan Noura followed the pattern that is uh, uh, that oil companies, especially North American oil companies, uh, um, inherited from their previous history. You know, from the late 1800s, early nine, uh, 1900s, between the two uh, world wars, 
uh, and it was re-established in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, that is, you know, uh, one camp, you know, for the laborers, mostly local, they would be. Uh, then another camp in for the, um, uh, if you will, you know, the American uh, or European um, uh, staff, uh, mostly would be engineers or, or middle management. And then, you know, the, 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 the tank uh, farm uh, very close to the, um, uh, to the port. Um, this formula, although very simple, it's extremely important uh, in how Khobar was conceived. Um, Khobar was, uh, I would expect it would, could have been planned much earlier than 1947. If it, if it was not for the um, uh, uh, outbreak of the Second World War. Uh, so from the years almost 39 to 45, uh, oil operations in, in Dahran almost, uh, they were almost halted. Uh, and in the literature of Aramco, uh, that, that period from 39 to 45 is called the 100 men era. Literally, there were only probably 100 men or less of Aramco staff uh, in Dahran or in Khobar uh, or in, in Rastan Nora, just keeping the operations, you know, at minimal, um, uh, minimal readiness because there was, uh, it was virtually impossible uh, to, to ship oil uh, out of the, of the Gulf. Um, this is Dahran camp at that time. There was not even urbanization in Dahran itself. Um, before I, <laughs> I keep uh, postponing Khobar, but before we jump to Khobar directly, uh, I want to highlight a concept here uh, that, were, that is critical for understanding how Khobar was uh, planned. And that is the company time, town typology that was born uh, out of uh, you know, the capital uh, enterprise in, in North America, especially. Um, it's, uh, it's a typology that mixes you know, the, the capital or the industry and the community or the laborers. Uh, and uh, the company town typology is, 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 a, is, a, is a concept that is um, part of the manufacturing uh, economy in, in general, uh, but it's also um, very specific to extraction economy that is mining or oil industry, because mostly mining and oil industries are away from uh, major urban centers in, in remote sites. So, and they, need, and they are labor intensive. So they need it by necessity to establish their own communities away you know, from the major urban, uh, uh, major urban centers, wherever they were. Um, in North America, especially uh, towards the, 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 the late half or the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, the, the, the company town uh, typology flourished uh, and started you know, from the typical mill towns of North America. Uh, a mill town is a very small community, really. You cannot really call it a city because it just, uh, it's, a, it's just a residential camp. It doesn't have any other civic amenities uh, as big as a city. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, mill towns, they would be actually dependent on uh, agricultural products and converging them into industrial products like cotton or sugar or uh, these things. But this concept, uh, the mill towns were the precursors of much larger uh, industrial uh, uh, industrial towns or company towns, uh, first of which uh, that is the, 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 the example that is uh, highly cited in, in urban planning history is, is the city of Pullman in Illinois, uh, which was completely uh, planned from A to Z by Pullman uh, Car Company. Uh, it was a company that built train cars. Uh, and, uh, but this town was um, Pullman, Illinois. Uh, it was not, again, you know, it was not a, like a public realm. It's, uh, it's a town, the size of a town, with all the facilities of a town, like um, a church, schools, uh, parks, um, public squares, a hotel, uh, even theaters, but it's all owned uh, by Pullman Company. Uh, and, and therefore, Pullman was uh, completely controlled by its own uh, uh, company, uh, the, the company itself was the employer of 
or every resident in the, com in, in, in the town. It was also the landlord. So it got the power of actually, um, uh, you know, the uh, naming or, or setting, you know, the, the, the rental uh, uh, and the price of food and everything uh, that is, goes on in town. Uh, it, Pullman itself, Mr. Pullman, whom you see his picture here, um, was a, a very, um, you know, patriarchal person. He even uh, controlled what kind of plays would be played in the, in the theater house uh, in the town. But more importantly, the, the cost of living was much higher than the market at that time, just because of the, of the excessive control of, of the landlord. It was about 30% of the wages of, 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 these, uh, of, of the employees. Eventually, uh, people left uh, uh, Pullman because it was impossible uh, to live there economically, it was not feasible, and uh, it it uh, I mean this led, of course, to uh, a lot of uh, workers unrest, and eventually uh, the, the 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 city was shut down. Um, uh, the other example that is cited, which is it's linked to Pullman, uh, in the sense that it followed a plan that is completely the opposite of what happened in Pullman, Illinois. That is the city of Gary, Indiana. It was built by United States Steel Company, another you know industrial giant. giant. And for uh, and these two cities were, were were built according to a plan, uh, a grid plan again. Um, but this one, especially uh, Gary, Indiana, um, was not as differentiated or diversified as Pullman. It didn't have any public amenities uh, because the company didn't want to uh, actually. Uh, carry the burden of financing those amenities. Um, it didn't, um, uh, the, the company was not the landlord. In fact, one of the reasons why um, uh, Pullman, uh, Illinois, were, you know, uh, was shut down is because of the excessive control of the, of the company, which was the landlord. And here, the landlord was a third party independent company that was hired by uh, uh, United States uh, Steel Company. Uh, the public amenities were left to to the residents uh, to lobby for uh, if they wanted schools or theaters or hotels or grocery stores. They, you know, they, uh, uh, they it was left to the market forces. You know, to to uh, to come and and establish uh, and you know develop this town. The um, the growth of the city was completely unregulated. The 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 company U.S. Steel didn't have any claim on the land or the um, or the assets uh, in, in its own company town, which meant eventually uh, everyone uh, was able to sell or buy or invest, and eventually uh, it defies the whole purpose. Uh, this became just a town like any other town, and most of its workforce, you know, uh, left basically or looked for uh, uh, work some. Other place, and so it didn't serve the purpose. Uh, although it was completely uncontrolled development, completely deregulated planning, uh, it was still grid, grid iron, uh, but uh, it was uh, not um, administered by the company. And although it was established, it didn't serve eventually the purpose of uh, of a company town. Uh, from the Around you know the the time or the the, the 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 from like the second half of the nineteenth uh, twentieth century from eighteen fifty to nineteen hundreds, uh, that's a very cr critical uh, period for us as 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 built environment uh, specialists. Um, before that, and based on those um, two examples of company towns, uh, but there are uh, around that time you know statistics show that there were. There were about 120 company towns in North America alone of that type. Um, there were voices, you know, that started calling for um, more, you know, public engagement with uh, with the quality of the built environment, uh, calling for a more independent professional uh, who will be uh, an arbitrator or a buffer between the the client, uh, the industry. And the people, the the final, uh, uh, the end users of, of of these towns, 
the residents. And, uh, but at that time, there, there was no regulation. And uh, if, um, if I have to mention one source here, it's, uh, it's the, a book uh, titled The Promise of American Life, written by Herbert Crawley, who was the editor of the architectural record at that time. And he was one of the exponents of, of calling for more professionalism and uh, applying more standards, quality standards or design standards to ensure uh, you know, the public interest uh, without trespassing on, on, uh, uh, on, on, on the capital interest of developers such as you know, the big industrial companies. Um, a lot of development uh, took place at that time. Uh, AIA, which uh, on, on its platform we are speaking tonight, uh, was started in New York in 1857 exactly for those reasons by a group of about 12 architects who advocated uh, more public responsibility or social responsibility of the design profession. Uh, and this advocacy group um, became the American Institute of Architects eventually, uh, a group that regulates you know, the profession. Um, in order to apply or call for um, uh, standards or technical uh, expertise. Uh, you need also to teach these things to start from the educational stage. And uh, so in 1968, immediately after the formation of the AIA, or 10 years after, um, the first architecture program was established at MIT. Uh, the first licensing of an architect took place in Chicago in 79. And the first landscape architecture program was actually offered at Harvard in 1899. So by the end of the 19th century, uh, already, you know, standards uh, and uh, design standards uh, were established uh, to control the development of, of towns and, 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 and urban spaces. Um, <clears throat> Standards are very important in, uh, uh, in when we discuss Khobar, and we'll come to that. The um, American oil industry, uh, when it reached the Gulf, it didn't come directly. It started first in North America um, until 1900s. Between, 1900, between 1910 and 1920, uh, it uh, moved south to Latin America, uh, and from Latin America, uh, it reached uh, the, the Gulf, uh, the Arabian Gulf, uh, eventually, uh, a little before the Second World War, uh, in Bahrain first, then in Saudi Arabia, in, in Dahran. Uh, here you see a similar experiments of company towns. This is in Chile. Uh, in a mining uh, site, uh, nitrate mining site, and the, the same gridiron um, um, thumbnail, so to speak, uh, uh, planning was uh, 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 followed or applied. Uh, I, I mean, the grid is not uh, is not something new. It uh, it's as old as 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 history itself. But I would think this is part of the. Um, um, you know, the, the capital uh, tendency, you know, to reduce cost and to expedite, you know, the uh, construction process and a grid could have be, would be, you know, the easiest solution to do so. Um, uh, the same site, uh, which was a complete town with its own hospital and residence and other facilities. Um, after the Second World War, uh, the grid itself or the company town, which is based on the grid iron uh, template, was challenged. Uh, and ideas like the Garden Cities movement and uh, even uh, you know, the American suburbs at that time, uh, away from the major American cities or in the outskirts of American major cities, were also you know, questioned. Uh, uh, the book, Building the, Amer or the Working Man uh, Paradise, is, is a book I actually recommend because it discusses all of these issues uh, until the Second uh, World War. Before going to Dahran and Khobar, Aramco was in Venezuela, uh, as I mentioned earlier. 
moving from North America to Latin America, to the Gulf, to Bahrain especially, and then on to, to Saudi Arabia. But in, 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 uh, in Venezuela, Aramco experimented with the th three-tier uh, city planning based on uh, either uh, the, um, the working or the garden cities or uh, based on uh, the grid, the simple grid, but also the, the zoning of, uh, of, of a company town. So you could see here the, um, uh, the standard oil of California site in, in, uh, in Judibana uh, near Maracibo uh, in Venezuela. And the, the zoning was exactly the same zoning that was applied in Rastanora. That's the labor camp, uh, the middle management camp, and then the senior management camp. And with each, you could see the, um, the plan is, 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 um, is growing or, or developing. So, you know, labor camp, which is designed mostly for the locals, follow the grid, which is quick and easy to, to build. Uh, and until you reach the senior or the um, North American staff of, of the company, uh, or most, uh, mostly a gated community, I would assume, uh, that follows you know, the, the American suburbia of, of the post-war America. You could see here, the, um, um, I'm bringing back Floyd Oliger, because before he came to, um, uh, to uh, the, the city of, uh, of Dahran, he was actually, and most of his staff that started Dahran camp were, uh, were in, in Venezuela uh, at the Standard Oil of California which was named Crioli in Venezuela. Um, so they came with this experience that they established, urbanization experience in, in Venezuela. Uh, this is another shot of the same camp in Venezuela, and you could see very clearly here the, the labor camp and then the senior staff and the middle management or engineers. Um, <clears throat> Rasta Nura uh, followed the same, and it was an early experiment of how to build a camp in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, by the 1945, that's the end of the Second World War, um, crude production in Saudi Arabia uh, took a, a steep, um, uh, you know, a steep rate and uh, it became, um, um, I mean, Dahran became uh, like a, a node or an anchor point uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia that attracted people not only from uh, Saudi Arabia, from other, uh, other parts of Saudi Arabia, but also from abroad. Um, Aramco expanded its operations. Uh, if, you, if you read the, the, the records of, of, of Aramco, the, the size of operation here in, in Dahran uh, of crude production and refining in Rastanura was, uh, was multiples of the size of uh, oil production in Venezuela at that time or in any other site. This was an a unprecedented scale of, uh, of operation and production. Aramco brought a lot of staff members from builders and, and, and technicians, you know, from other places in the Middle East. Uh, they brought 1,600 uh, Italian masons just to build these facilities in Dahran and Rasta Nora and at Geig and and Khobar and Dammam. Um, in Saudi Arabia, which is very important, the first major internal migration took place. Thousands of people migrated from other places in Saudi Arabia, including as far as Jeddah uh, or the north of Saudi Arabia or even the middle of Saudi Arabia who went to look for work in Dahran in 1945 and, and, and on, of course. Um, one of the most important developments that took place uh, that uh, are two things actually, or two, two major developments. That the government, in order to um, urbanize Al Khobar, uh, issued you know, a, a land lease act in 1935, in 1939, which, was, uh, which took also another steep growth uh, in 45, that people who are Saudi citizens have you know, the right to lease land at a nominal price from the government uh, for 10 years. Uh, and uh, the other uh, important development that Aramco didn't want actually to be the mayor or, or the, uh, of, 
of Dahran and Khobar and all of these towns. Uh, so uh, they didn't want to be responsible for the infrastructure. So they established at Aramco what they called the Arab Industrial Development uh, Department, AIDD, which, base, which supported uh, smart Arab Aramco employees uh, with technical expertise and a bit of finance to establish their own companies you know, for industries that the, the, the community needed. So the first, all the merchants that you could think of now in the Eastern province uh, started uh, our graduates or al alumni of AIDD, the, the first uh, electric, electric power company, the, the first uh, natural gas company, the, the, the first uh, building material uh, workshops, the first transportation uh, companies, uh, uh, all of these are offshoots of, of Aramco uh, or Aramco helping technically its own employees to have to establish their own businesses. Um, the increase of um, the increase of employees uh, uh, in 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 Dahran especially uh, created uh, a, a major infrastructural problem for uh, uh, for Aramco. Uh, Aramco as a company didn't want to increase its overhead uh, again you know it, it's working in oil and oil is the high risk um, industry according to aramco uh, it could stop flowing at any moment uh, their concession agreement could stop at any moment so they were running, running a very high risk um, um, uh, you know operation and they wanted to minimize you know the, their like circle of responsibility as much as they could uh, and that's why they um, Aramco was resistant of actually taking in uh, its non-American employees into its own camps um, the Haran camp for a very long time looked like this in fact uh, it was like shanty town on the outskirts uh, outside you know the the Dahran camp uh, except you know the only landmark was the, the the mosque that was built by the by the people there actually uh, but it was completely segregated this is the labor labor camp of Aramco in Dahran um, and Aramco would welcome uh, very much um, a solution uh, sorry a solution that would actually satisfy its own uh, labor force. Uh, at the same time, uh, it would actually uh, relieve Aramco from being responsible to all of these people. So in 1947, Khobar uh, plan was, uh, was, was um, kind of suggested by the government, uh, which Aramco actually uh, welcomed and wanted uh, to do as fast as possible because it would mean that uh, the labor camps, for instance, could actually move to Khobar, uh, and people who are living here could actually go uh, to Khobar and have permanent residence there, and um, uh, relieve Aramco actually from the pressure uh, to use its own facilities um, inside the camp. So this is the um, uh, Dahran camp here, and uh, Khobar, and later on, you would, uh, you would see the Dahran International Airport uh, uh, in 1959 or so. The final formula uh, after 1947, the, the grid was established of, of Khobar on the, on the banks of the, of the Gulf. But uh, about 15 minutes drive uh, uh, to the east of Khobar or to the west of Khobar, you'd find uh, Mothership or, or Dahran, uh, uh, workings, workings Man Paradise, uh, something like, that looks like a suburb of any American town in the Midwest uh, of North America. While Khobar was designed as a, as a, as a, as a perfect grid, uh, almost as a, an infinite grid, you know, without any differentiation. Um, it's for me, or my interpretation is that this was uh, it looks like a one company town that was torn you know in the middle from the middle uh, and uh, a labor camp was established as al khobar and the company town or the senior staff 
was left in Dharan, as, as I call it here, the mothership. Um, if we look back, you know, to all of this uh, analysis uh, very quickly, um, I don't think there was really, um, you know, a major study. Uh, the, the sources are very limited when it comes to how Khobar was conceived. But I think it's just, um, you know, the, the, the planning standards of Aramco that Aramco used as from its own handbooks uh, of establishing its new communities that you see uh, repeating itself in many, many other sites, not only in Khobar, but as you can see here, even in Arar to the northern borders uh, of Saudi Arabia, the city of Arar didn't exist before Aramco actually planned it you know, uh, uh, from scratch. I mean, there was no city uh, there. It was a completely nomadic environment. Um, but it followed exactly the same thumbnail approach, I would say. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the schedule uh, that you see uh, in this slide, if we, uh, uh, comp if we look at Pullman in Illinois and Gary, Indiana, and Dahran and Khobar, and just compare them very quickly, uh, based on their planning scheme and civic services uh, and who is the landlord and how the city was administered. Uh, uh, Pullman as, as Dahran, both were bespoke uh, plans because the planner knew its client, knew its final end users. Uh, the civic services were completely planned as well by the company, whether in Pullman or in Dahran by Aramco for its own North American audience, so they got everything they needed there, supermarkets, cinemas, hospitals, swimming pools, everything. The landlord in Pullman was completely the, the, the company, and in Dahran, it was the company as well. Uh, administration of, 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 the, of, of the city in, in Pullman was also the company, as well as in Dahran. Uh, but when it came to Khobar, uh, Aramco changed policy uh, 180 degrees. So uh, planning Khobar, uh, was not actually uh, a bespoke because they didn't, or they didn't probably research their own client. It would be just the general public of Saudi Arabia. So they used the simplest and easiest rule of thumb uh, planning, which is the gridiron. Uh, the civic services, they were completely unplanned in Khobar. There were no spe specific sites for schools or hospitals, or it would be just an uh, increment of the same uh, uh, 50 by 70 uh, city blocks that uh, Aramco created. The landlord would be a third party. Aramco had nothing to do with, with Khobar. They planned it and gave the plan to the government to run it. And the administration also was third party. So between the government and whoever is developing, you know, what it, whatever uh, uh, city blocks. Um, I would say that Khobar and Dahran were like a mix of Pullman, Illinois model and Gary, Indiana model. A mix of a com completely controlled, uh, uh, completely controlled uh, development, so, which is Dahran, and completely deregulated or uncontrolled uh, um, uh, development that is Khobar. Um, if we like um, land on the ground and look at Khobar from the from the street level uh, and see the standards. And these standards that were applied by Aramco based on their, I think, uh, engineering handbooks, uh, they were the introduced for the first time in Saudi Arabia. Uh, street sections, um, for instance, uh, uh, the Khobar was the first city in Saudi Arabia to be built for the car, which was the thing after the Second World War. Uh, there was no major, you know, uh, ownership of cars in the entire Saudi Arabia by, by that time. Uh, street lighting, because there was a power, uh, uh, a power station, and none of the other cities in Saudi Arabia had, not even Riyadh, the capital. Uh, Mecca, which is the, the site of the most sacred site uh, for Islam, had its first uh, electric power in 1947, exactly the same year that uh, Khobar was, was planned. Um, it had its, uh, Khobar had its own vehicular and pedestrian traffic management. Uh, most streets were one-way streets. They were even planned uh, like Midwestern uh, small towns. So uh, like the east-west streets would be, uh, would be numbered 
and north south streets would be um, uh, named with 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 names. Um, <clears throat> All of this was new to the people. Um, uh, you, you see here on the left, uh, a group of, of, of Saudi men uh, sitting, probably waiting for a company car or a bus in, in Khobar uh, in sometime in 1949 or so. Um, this urban scene uh, is the reincarnation of the typical urban scene in the region at that time when people use their, uh, spend most of their time actually in the, in the public areas of their own towns. Uh, this, this is a picture of, of Qatif market at that time, but the introduction of automobile, automobile movement uh, or transportation uh, uh, presented a totally new uh, uh, urban reality. Uh, and Khobar was actually, um, at that time when you read, you know, the local, uh, history of people who lived at that time and who uh, memoirs and all of these things, uh, you would notice that Khobar was like a brand, you know, a totally new brand. It's a city of the future uh, after the Second World War in Saudi Arabia. The, um, the type of architecture in Khobar didn't change immediately. Um, they established, you know, methods of construction and and and. And, and local traditional architecture were controlled, you know, here by the new standards of sticking to your own uh, uh, block, you know, perimeter or lot perimeters. Uh, so although this is an ex this is the first school in Khobar in 1949, uh, although it was built using, um, um, you know, traditional techniques, the the um, the way it was built. Uh, is completely you can see like there is complete control of the of the grid and of the new standards. Um, <clears throat> Aramco developed the standards even of safety in Khobar at that time. So the construction that you would see here, uh, most likely you know the roofing would would be wooden wooden framing, uh, but uh, Aramco um, I think required for fire safety that people would build with, um, with any new buildings would be uh, uh, built out of uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, and uh, you could see here even the, um, uh, the, um, the repair of, 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 of this building on King Khal Street, which we'll, we'll talk about later on, uh, was done by concrete blocks, which was the new language, you know, in the early, uh, in the late 1940s. Um, Eventually, all of the architecture has changed. Uh, the building types, new building types emerged. Here you see a hospital. Um, uh, the introduction of electric power in Khobar enabled uh, importing um, uh, electric powered production lines like the first, uh, you see here the first, this is a picture of the first uh, concrete block uh, factory actually in Khobar that produced you know, the building material that you would see here or even uh, there. Um, <clears throat> King Khalid Street became the, the new public face of Khobar. Um, and although the, the grid is, is, is uniform, uh, on, like, uh, on, a, on smaller details, uh, it's not really. The King Khalid Street was named uh, the Champs Elysees of, of Saudi Arabia, and uh, people who would travel from other places uh, in Saudi Arabia and who would go to Khuba to visit relatives or uh, uh, to spend vacation would be would come back with with awesome, you know, uh, impressions of of the city that is lit even by night. Um, King Khalid Street, especially, became the new public space, although it is shared by the car with the people, it became the public space of, of, of the city. Uh, and you could see here the, um, uh, a picture of King Saud at that time visiting uh, Khobar and uh, his motorcade or, you know, would promenade in, uh, in, at King Khalid Street where he would actually greet his, uh, the, the, the subjects or his, his subjects. Um, King Khalid Street also became the, um, you know, it's the first, uh, you know, Khobar was like the first 
place in Saudi Arabia where consumption and uh, uh, became became a daily uh, practice. Um, it became uh, like the place where actually businesses would open. Uh, and um, right now, um, of course, it's not the same as it was, but uh, uh, in this like very short analysis, we will a bit will like shed some light on 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 the street and how it, how it started and how it became. And um, King Khalid Street uh, was twenty meters wide, uh, so it gave enough space compared to all streets next to it uh to you know for activities to take place it had direct connectivity to the major dahran road that you see here uh so um according to the grid iron plan the original one uh it was in an extremely favor favorable position you know to be a collector street almost like oxford street in in, in london uh if we look at um uh, a histogram of the life of the street when it started. Uh, this is in 1963. It picked up, you know, its brand name. In 68, it it ga it gained all of its like green vegetation and uh, street furniture, and uh, uh, it became like a place, a proper place where you could actually just walk and enjoy yourself. Uh, in 74, it became a, a mature place where actually people would go to shop for the latest, uh, you know, in, in, in the Gulf, not only uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, but in the entire Gulf. Um, in, in 86, uh, the street lost some of its, um, um, you know, iconic ingredients, I would say. Very simple, but very important fundamental uh, uh, ingredients, uh, vegetation, awnings, uh, the type and variety of uh, uh, of uh, businesses uh, on the street. Um, so, um, if we look at the major strategic changes of how the street was um, has changed, you know, uh, from 1968 up until today, uh, you would see that at that time this is the intersection between King Khalid Street here and uh, the um, Dahran uh, Highway, which links uh, the sea to Dahran. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, King Khal Street was completely, um, uh, was a proper urban space. Starting in the 1980s, uh, Dahran Road, you know, started being, uh, you know, uh, transformed uh, to uh, to a major highway that leads to Dharan and to Dammam. And right now, it's a highway, 12-lane highway, with a tunnel, uh, like the link between the street and the major feeder uh, highway was complete, is completely disrupted here. And King Khal Street is just, um, you know, cars would come, you know, uh, breeze through the tunnel, and go all the way to Dharan, and even the entire grid of Khobar is not noticed. There were attempts early attempts to, to, to redesign the street and through, you know, signage and, and, and street furniture and natural elements like trees and vegetation. Uh, but right now, um, this is a fairly early picture. Uh, this building was one of the major actually addresses of, of businesses in, in the, in, at King Khal Street and it's in a complete dire condition right now. Um, the, the municipality try to revive the street, but to, the, with very um, um, limited tactical moves, because, you know, um, like, uh, for instance, here, what they did is, is this, you know, street pavements and uh, uh, reintroducing, you know, passage points, you know, for pedestrian, but uh, this is extremely tactical compared to the major, you know, strategic uh, break that the state has with its own uh, grid. Uh, other attempts uh, in other parts of Khobar, uh, which are appreciated, but um, they are still tactical. I mean, it's uh, it's good as long as uh, it continues uh, operating that day. But once you know the, this activity is done, uh, the these parts of the city will be completely forgotten again. Um, <clears throat> 
this is the grid that you have seen at the beginning of the presentation. Um, as you can see here, the, um, uh, the city lost or the grid lost its edge. So it, it, com it just continued you know, to multiply uh, infinitely all the way to, to, uh, to Dahran almost. It's very hard now to separate, uh, to know where Dahran stops and where Khobar starts. But this is original Khobar. Um, this whole, like this is the original 1947 plan. Uh, right now it's completely, um, um, I would say, deregulated. I mean, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't hold, uh, you know, the kind of activity or uh, promise that it, it held, you know, from 1947 until almost like uh, the mid 80s. Um, uh, the, um, the, the population as well as the quality of uh, infrastructure uh, is still good, but it's completely abandoned and people, as you, uh, as you could imagine, you know, um, moved away, you know, to other parts of, of, uh, of, of uh, Khobar and the Eastern province. Um, the, the, the situation um, uh, or the deterioration was intensified by uh, the establishment of these highways that actually tunnel uh, 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 traffic away from uh, these uh, from the original uh, town. Um, <clears throat> um, well, Khobar, as we see or as we have seen, was uh, born out of this magic touch of uh, uh, of um, uh, of the oil industry. Uh, it was a perfect um, uh, or a new development for Saudi Arabia's uh, urbanization effort. Uh, the standards that were established in Khobar were applied actually in, in Riyadh and other places eventually afterwards, at least street uh, standards and infrastructural standards. Um, it's not too late, I believe. Uh, other places, and I'm uh, using here, uh, uh, sorry, um, um, Barcelona as an example, I mean, uh, uh, other places that uh, applied, you know, the grid uh, um, could still, uh, I think we could still um, uh, rejuvenate uh, Khobar uh, on a strategic level. Um, and uh, you could see here, the, um, for instance, the, um, uh, in, in Barcelona, just by uh, introducing, uh, re in rerouting traffic and uh, uh, regaining, you know, the urban space that was occupied by car uh, before, uh, and give it back, you know, to the pedestrians and to the people. Um, the exercise here in in uh, Barcelona, for instance, um, uh, reduced, you know, the the area uh, that was occupied uh, by cars just by rerouting, uh, um, rerouting traffic and creating sober blocks out of the smaller blocks. Uh, almost, um, you know, they, they gained almost, uh, um, uh, or they minimized, you know, the surface area that is occupied by car by 45%, which is, I think, uh, very um, respectable. Um, <clears throat> what's next? Uh, I don't think we will uh, have any more oil uh, to, um, uh, to jumpstart a new city or Khobar, but uh, there are other... Uh, uh, I think th there are other places where we could actually find a magic touch, just like the magic touch of oil. And um, that is, um, you know, uh, uh, COVID-19, in fact, you know, uh, pointed us to some of these um, uh, attempts that already started, but we've seen, noticed how um, uh, intensive they are, you know, during the um, lockdown of the past few months. Uh, Khobar is, as an infrastructure, is still extremely viable. Uh, it's one of the strategic, I think, mistakes is removing the airport, the Hran old airport, which was much closer to Khobar and sending it away, you know, about an hour away by car. But the, um, the existing airport is still there. It's, an, it's a military base. Part of it could be actually uh, a logistics hub uh, and uh, a few are interested, this book is called uh, Aerotropolis. It's a new movement or a new look at urban uh, places or urban sites uh, where, you know, airports, you know, uh, will be providing the major logistics hubs of the future since we are 
you know, moving very, very uh, uh, in a fast way, you know, towards, you know, subscription economy where you could actually procure all of your services, you know, not depending on car, but all of these services, whether food or uh, grocery or merchandise or even uh, transportation, you could just uh, have them all uh, come uh, to you, you know, through, uh, through the internet. Um, Khobar could be a creative city and I could see uh, personally, you know, from my side visits to Khobar that th there are, you know, pockets of creativity in Khobar, like gourmet food, for instance, on the northern edge of Khobar, but other places as well. The infrastructure is great to actually house a creative economy. Creative economy could be anything that is out of the talent of the people. It doesn't have to be only fine art, but anything that is dependent on, on, on genuine talent of, of, of the citizens. Um, sorry. With that, I uh, come to an end. Thank you so much for being uh, so patient and listening to me. Thank and I'm happy to answer any questions or, or feedback. Thank you ever so much. So Althoff, thank you so much for this very beautiful presentation. I really enjoyed the uh, kind of how you took us through Gary and Pullman and then turn it all between Bahran and Khobar. So that was very, uh, very beautiful, making Khalid comparison through time. So with that, uh, I would like to take questions. Um, I have a couple of questions that I received from Ra'id Al-Talibi. Uh, Mr. Atov, do you see the questions by any chance? Um, no. Unless I stop, I think but I shouldn't maybe stop my... Uh... Okay, I will... No, I don't see them. You, you could read them for everyone. Yeah, I'll read the question. Uh, what is the vision of Mr. Al Shehri for how Khobar will contribute to sustainability environments in Saudi Arabia and also in the Gulf region area? And are there any examples for sustainable architecture in urban areas in Khobar? So before you ask this, Mr. Atal, I'd just like to say anyone who would like to ask any question, please raise your hand or you can add it to the Q&A. I can read them to Mr. Atal. So raise your hand and I'll allow you to talk or Sir Althoff will um, answer them in the Q&A box that you have. Please go ahead. Um, as I said, you know, the, um, in the last slide, um, uh, uh, sustainability is a very complex, uh, is a very complex thing, of course. It's, um, it's uh, you know, there are many uh, issues and uh, uh, factors involved in what sustainability is, but if you speak about urban su sustainability, definitely Khobar is a resource. Uh, it could be adapted, uh, definitely, because the infrastructure is there, uh, and actually it has a very good infrastructure. Um, and and uh, as well, um, you know, any um, um, even tactical, you know, moves like, you know, um, um, uh, altering the grids or the grid system to uh, to be uh, to create sober blocks not all over the the city but maybe at certain points that could be an answer um, uh, that that could be a major um, um, change you know the, uh, definitely sustainability should happen on a on a policy level so um, unless there is a change of policy uh, regarding you know the how municipality is running the city. I don't think you know there will be um, any very sustainable solution you know into the future. But it's a resource. Uh, the city is there. It's a resource. Uh, we can't just expand you know infinitely away from Khobar. Uh, that is a lot of pressure on the uh, existing infrastructure. Uh, a lot of pressure on the uh, transportation networks. I think we should start. The first rule of thumb for sustainability is to. Uh, use in a smart way what you already have. And I think uh, this is the first step. Ali? Okay, yes, great, thank you so much. Uh, I have Mr. Ahmed Mohammed who has his hand raised. I'm gonna allow you to talk. I'm gonna take the questions also that are in the Q&A. Mr. Uh, Ahmed, you may unmute yourself and talk whenever you're ready. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, do you, can you hear us? Are you ready to speak? Okay, whilst you get ready, Mr. Ahmed, I have another question from Mr. Rashid Al-Mullah, 
who says, what was the main driving factor that caused for Gulf cities to not be walkable? I see from Khobar's aerial view that there was a possibility of producing multimodal transportation system other than cars. Very good question. I wish I know. Um, it's definitely walkability is something that we suffer daily, all of us. Um, and um, <clears throat> I think it's simply that uh, there was no vision into the future. Uh, although Khobar could very easily, because I mean, original Khobar, not the infinite space that you have seen at the last slide. Uh, original Khobar could definitely be. Uh, okay, I could hear my voice. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, you'll go next. Sorry, please continue. Okay, uh, if, if people could mute their mics, please, uh, unless they want to speak. Uh, so uh, walkability is definitely is not only a problem of Khobar, it's a problem in all of Saudi cities. Uh, there, is no, um, there is no public transport. That's the first rule of thumb. If you want people to walk uh, a reasonable distance, you have to take care of the public transportation. So we don't have public transportation in Khobar. That's the first um, uh, deficiency. Uh, and uh, again, you know, the... I think the green infrastructure, you know, that's um, important, you know, for walkability, you know, to provide shade at extreme uh, temperatures, you know, these are all um, uh, basic, uh, you know, planning issues or urban design issues that haven't been resolved. Uh, so, yes, the scale of Khobar could have been, uh, is, an extre is extremely ideal for wa walking because uh, the distances are reasonable, in fact, between blocks, and uh, and the street sections are could create, you know, a reasonable amounts of shade. Uh, if trees were still there, uh, if vegetation was still there, if, if if public transportation is there, then you could talk about walkability. But for now, when people cannot get to Khobar from other towns, they have to take their, their cars. That's you know, it's a planning issue. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, so Atif, actually, in addition to that, what I had also heard was that uh, in a way it was for, you know, in a way not to promote transportation, you know, multi-model transportation, part of that was to create a local market for the oil that Saudi Arabia was, the Kenyan Saudi Arabia was producing. How do you view that? Uh, I don't think so. You know, m most of the, I mean, you mean th there was no multimodal uh, transportation because Saudi Arabia wanted to sell oil uh, to create a local market for it, like you know, as cars. Are... I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't think so. Most of the Saudi oil is is sold as crude oil, you know, to abroad. So uh, I don't think you know that is. Uh, it's just. Um, I think it's a developmental issue. That's all. You know, the, um, our cities didn't have that extra layer of planning. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Mohammed, uh, you may ask a question. You can unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this uh, chance. Thanks uh, for Mr. Atif, the nice uh, lecture. Actually, very uh, useful information. I My question just uh, regarding the population growth with the uh, uh, traffic uh, mobility in the Khobar, how ca how could the people by uh, sprawling in the city and uh, in same time they can have their public uh, transport, their uh, any type of uh, mobility in the in the city? I mean that. Uh, you do the planning for transportation uh, for the population or not? Okay, so uh, are you asking about how like public transport was planned for Khobar or? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Khobar when it was first conceived as as a as a as a city uh, as a grid, uh, it was built around car movement. As simple as that. Um, there, I don't think there is, the resources are very um, silent about 
you know, the actual technical investigation of the plan before, you know, producing the plan. Uh, but I don't think there was any, um, there was no major uh, public transportation scheme for Khobar. I think it, it was simply built as a grid iron development uh, for private car movement. That was the first, I think the, there, was, there was no vision of how the city would develop its own uh, public transportation system. Hello. Okay, uh, we'll take a question from Daniel Hender. Uh, Daniel says, Altaf, thank you so much for this talk. Can you provide what you think is the most successful city in Saudi Arabia that grew or evolved organically from its origin or its original condition? That's a difficult question, really. Um, um, I don't know. I don't think there is a successful Saudi city. Each that merged successfully its heritage or historical footprint with its expansion. I don't think there is um, such a thing. I mean, even in Barcelona itself, uh, is still uh, struggling with its heritage. Uh, so uh, Jeddah is, is a very good example, but it's, it, it has its own problems. Uh, Riyadh as well uh, is, is expanding beyond limits. So I don't think there is, um, um, I don't think, I'm sorry, Daniel, you know, there is no, uh, there is no successful, uh, per se, uh, example. Each city, each one of these major cities um, had its own share of um, growth uh, or accelerated rapid urbanization, uh, uh, you know, uh, difficulties and, and problems. I would still choose Khobar to start any, uh, any intervention because um, Khobar started, it's the only city or the, that started from scratch. Uh, and it could be, I think, uh, presented, you know, as a good example. I, I, I would still say Khobar, in fact, if you want me to ch name one. Okay, um, before, I take, before I take more questions, I just want to remind everyone that uh, this presentation, if you've included your AIA number in the registration, we will, give you credits for that. Second of all, this will be posted on our YouTube account as well. So if you'd like to, you know, visit the presentation again, it will be available. It's just the AI Middle East YouTube channel. Uh, just very quickly, I want to mention that we will have next Saturday, we'll have another presentation by Oliver Baxter called the psychology of collaboration. It's basically about how our offices can be more collaborative spaces. It's research that basically Herman Miller, the workplace furniture design company has, uh, or design and manufacturing company has, has, has done. Uh, in light of that, the registration link for that is on our um, Instagram page in our bio, and you'll also receive information on that in your emails, hopefully uh, soon. So let's take another question uh, from H. Mark Teslam, he says, excellent historic tracing. Thanks, Altaf. I was wondering about the similarities between already established cities in close proximity in Bahrain and Khobar. Similarities and differences? Um, <clears throat> um, I don't think um, I didn't answer yet, so I need to see it. Now I can see questions, actually. Um, so Hana um, Matasan. Um, I don't think there are any similarities. I mean, there are similarities between oil towns. Uh, let me correct myself. Uh, so oil towns, in fact, that popped up in Khuba, in, in the Gulf, they, uh, uh, they in, in Kuwait, for instance, they, um, they were established much later, like 20 years later than Khobar in the 60s. In, in Kuwait, for instance, I don't know in Bahrain if Babko had its own uh, major town because uh, Bahrain was populated already, um, and it was of a size that allowed you know for um, uh, for you know services and, and 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 goods to be procured you know very uh, within within reach. Um, so um, I don't think you know um, you could actually. Um, 
yeah, you could similarities. I mean, you could check out uh, Bahrain, definitely um, uh, oil industry uh, uh, history, Babco, and also KOC in Kuwait, Kuwait Oil Company uh, in Al Ahmadi. Th these are like similar uh, experiments, just like Khobar uh, and Dahran at the same time. Uh, but Khobar and Dahran, uh, bear in mind, they are the same experiment, but separated, you know, into uh, two parts. Um, what else is she asking about, Ali? Uh, I th yeah, I think the question was, you know, if there were any similarities. Uh, there, there are def definitely that uh, these are company towns. So the, they belong to the same family uh, or this typology of company towns that started in North America as mill towns, then as mining towns, then as oil towns, all the way to Latin America, then came to the Gulf uh, uh, later on. Um, there is also um, a question by uh, Hana Mu'tasim about King Khalid Street, yes, about the nodes. Um, uh, well, she, she says you discussed the path, King Khalid Street. What about nodes? Were there, were there any important attractions, public spaces? that steered public life in the city? Uh, no, in fact, no. Uh, again, um, there were no nodes, in fact. Uh, like the nodes were places where cars actually turned either left or right. Uh, so it was, maybe that's the error in the planning of the city that it was completely car laden, uh, completely um, um, specified for the car. There was no public scene, actually, or spirit in the, in the master plan itself. Um, yeah, this is my, my answer. Go ahead, Ali. Over to you. Okay. Uh, we'll take a question by Yusuf Saeed. He says, how can we restructure the quotes municipality, unquote, so that urban designers and professionals could actually play a role in re-knitting the city? And can we simply blame the legislators for the current fragmented situation? Um, it's very complex. Uh, the municipality is a very good question. I think in the municip if, if the municipality had more delegation of powers, probably then we could blame them. But their, their hands are tied because they have to stick to a master plan that comes from the, from the Ministry of, uh, of Municipal and Rural Affairs that is called the structural plan of any city. They cannot make any strategic changes to that. Municipalities are actually responsible for like day-to-day -day business of the city. So I don't want to be like extremely hard on them. Um, they, they, uh, they, they can't, uh, you know, make major changes. Um, so I think the answer is to re-delegate powers to municipalities. Um, and also, um, yes, I mean, um, this expansion of, it's not only a problem for Khobar, it's in all Saudi cities, expansion away you know, from, the, from the cities, on the outskirts of the cities. It is a legislation issue, uh, definitely. Uh, it is also like land speculation issue, but that can be controlled only by uh, legislators. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's about uh, public policy as well as the design itself. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Mina Zeki. Um, Sir Atif, it was a pleasure to listen to your informative lecture on Al Khobar and Dahran. Sir Ali, always a pleasure to see you. And thank you, Mina. Pleasure to see you too. My question is that why, as a part of transforming Al Khobar and Dahran, it did not continue to be part of transportation hub, as to convey the, as to convey intermodal concepts of ways of transportation other than the mum. For example, being the central arrival and departure points for trans transportation, i.e. airports, train stations, or seaport authorities. Yeah, very good. Um, first, uh, like the first strategic error that happened is that the, uh, the, like the first international airport was Dahran Airport, and it was just like 10 minutes away from Khobar, or less. And it, it was transferred to another location, which is extremely far away. So it took all the traffic and major development potential, you know, away from, uh, from Khobar and from the sea. Uh, the other strategic mistake is that uh, that little port of Khobar, 
However small it was, it was extremely useful and it was shut down in the early 80s, okay? That's also another uh, major error uh, and it had a lot of potential if it was developed. Uh, uh, that is one thing. My proposal, you know, like the last slide I was showing is that uh, part of this, you know, transportational logistic uh, talent or, 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 or of Khobar or potential uh, could be regained. Uh, I don't think we could bring the whole airport back, but at least the logistics part of, of, of the airport transportation, uh, air transport could be brought back nearer, you know, in the old airport. Uh, it could be shared with the military airport and it's much easier to share than a passenger airport. And Khobar is, is there, and it could be actually um, uh, a place, you know, that supports, you know, this, uh, this in, in industry. Yes, uh, Dahran is a special case. Dahran, as I explained earlier, is completely controlled, gated community. Uh, it's, um, it's not really, it's a site, but it's not a town, I would say. It's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a town or it's not a city. Uh, it, it, it's a campsite of Aramco. Okay. I think Bahran in many ways is similar to how uh, Awali or Babko's town is. Exactly. It, there, was a, there is a city that's not very far away. And in that respect, Khabar to Bahran is what the rest of Bahrain is to Awali, Babko, Bahrain. Um, that, that is very true. Yeah. We'll take a question from Wala Saeed. She says, why till this moment, there is no serious change in the urban development scheme in the Gulf area? Um, <laughs> million dollar question. Like Ibn Ali, you could help me. Uh, I can't speak for the whole Gulf. Um, you know, like urbanization is a very long uh, process. It's not, uh, something that you change overnight or you even decide to change. Most plans or master plans change eventually, okay? Uh, I think part of the problem uh, is that um, change was rapid, accelerated, and not organic, okay? And, uh, and that is, you know, uh, when, uh, when, when, you know when, when it's difficult to measure change, in fact. But um, I think change comes as needed, of course. Um, but I don't know about the, like the entire Gulf. Definitely, as we have seen from history, using Al Khubar as an example, there was this magic touch. I mean, I keep saying this, but like oil industry was something that this area didn't know at all uh, until 1933, when all of these people who came from you know, uh, you know, from North America and other places of the world came with these machines and all of these things. And they, you know, found something underground that pe people were not aware of. And it was important for the rest of the world. That kind of, um, um, you know, uh, multiplying factor, so to, so to speak, as they call it in economics, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a factor such as oil that will create change not only in economy but in all other aspects of life you know in economy technology culture uh, how people live how people eat and how people you know build their own lives and and future i think that kind of change is needed you know to you know to to uh, create this quantum leap again great um we'll take a question from Raid al talib I have to say that he asked this question while you were presenting, so it might, you okay. may have touched on to an extent. He says, two other coastal large metropolitans are also designed as grid iron planning, Abu Dhabi and Barcelona. Well, uh, what, can we, uh, what can we say that this is a successful way of city development for cities based on company and are situa situated on coast at the same time? So I think the question is, um, Abu Dhabi and Barcelona, do you consider these to be successful considering their grids and they're on a coast? Um, but Barcelona was not a company town. It was a proper town, you know. Uh, um, so it was not built as, as a company site. Yes, it was built on, as a grid, 
uh, because uh, uh, El Difonso Cerda, the, the planner of, of, of Barcelona, conceived the um, future way of transportation is the tram, streetcar tram. And he built his city blocks uh, around you know, the, uh, the, the turning diameter of, of, of the tram uh, system. Uh, but Barcelona was um, um, was was a proper town. Abu Dhabi it, it, it's still open to public. Maybe part of it is built uh, according to a grid. Uh, but they both of them are not uh, proper company towns like Dahran uh, or Khobar. Uh, so uh, the um, the grid itself is 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 a you know, uh, whether you build according to a grid or not, it, it depends on many other factors, like the transportation, the, uh, the, the physiology of the grid itself, you know, the scale and uh, density and many, many other factors, you know, having the shape of a grid in itself, uh, I don't think it's, it's the only thing that we should look at. Uh, you, you would be looking at many other things, you know, uh, at the same time. So to, to say successful or not, uh, is not dependent on the geometric design of the street network or, or, or the city blocks. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a multiple uh, or multitude of other layers. Uh, this is a follow-up from Daniel's question about a more successful city or, or you know, what's a more yeah. successful city. It is from Rashid Al-Mullah. Would Yemba be the closest to optimal? Okay, uh, the cities of Yamba and Jubail. Jubail is, is not too far from Khobar, it's about an hour drive. Um, uh, Yamba and Jubail, uh, they, they, they belong to a different era. It's true, they both are company towns, uh, and the company is actually the, like the Royal Commission of Jubail and Yamba is the landlord, in fact, with some delegation of power you know, to, to the owners. So, but it, it, it was conceived in the 70s and it has a different dimension to it. Thank you for asking this question, Rashid, because Jubail and Yamba uh, are the two city plans where actually the question of identity was presented. Like what's, a, what's, what's an Arab town that is also uh, conducive of you know, uh, industrial uh, progress. So uh, Yamba and, and, and Jubail, I would agree they are very, very good, uh, very good successful uh, examples. And probably I should, um, you're right, Ali, I should uh, refer this to Daniel as well, that these two examples that were built later on or designed or conceived much later on uh, around like the early 1970s, they are better examples uh, as, 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 as company towns, semi open to the public, uh, but as, as experiments, they are much more successful than other, uh, than other uh, normal cities in Saudi Arabia in terms of daily life, in terms of uh, quality of life of their citizens, in terms of civic services and all of these things, yeah. Okay. Uh, last question from H. Martesson. You give quite an optimistic view of what might happen to the city post-oil. What are the drivers behind these projections? Example, Khobar could potentially grow as a regional knowledge research hub based on extending the influence and footprint of the King Fahad Petroleum University, Boston model. What other strengths can be explored to help envision the post-oil city that Khobar could be? And this is a beautiful example, a beautiful sentence, uh, a question to end with, actually. Well, yeah, the future. Um, again, uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Hannah, for, for the question. Um, if, if we take the... And it's good that we, we spoke about Jubail and Yamba. Uh, Jubail and Yamba, part of their success is that they are independent, independently administered. They, their municipality, which came up uh, during another question, the municipal power of Jubail and Yamba is, is independent. They run their own cities by, their, their, by themselves. Okay, so that kind of decentralized 
um, um, exp urban experiment is, I think, key to any uh, success of any future model. And we have seen that in Jubail and Yambo. Uh, and we have seen how successful then unsuccessful you could be in Khobar. Uh, and uh, so, yes, I would say that uh, a decentralized city administration uh, and then uh, you could like getting your hands dirty, basically coming to terms, you know, with the, with facts on the ground. That's very important. So for Khobar, for instance, it is within a region that is extremely advanced when it comes to educational um, quality in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the presence of King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals and uh, King Faisal University and other, you know, private schools and uh, all these research centers at Aramco and other places, uh, the whole industrial ecosystem in, in, in the Eastern province is professionally orientated. And uh, I think that is a very good, coupled with probably independent administration uh, uh, or semi-autonomous uh, administration of, of, of Khobar, uh, that would actually accelerate, accelerate and facilitate you know, positive change. This is what I, uh, I could think of right now. Plus, of course, um, um, uh, focusing on other um, uh, resources, uh, you know, talent economy, so to speak. I think you put it somewhere here in your question. I think it's very important because there is a lot of talent, but there is not the proper space, I think, that plays uh, the role of a platform for this talent. Ali, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, Sir Atul, thank you very much for making this first experiment, uh, for me at least, doing these webinars with the AIA, uh, Middle East and AIA International, a success. So thank you for making this successful. The presentation was awesome, witnessed or evidenced by the beautiful questions that we received in the end. Um, before we move on, just very quickly, I want to share my screen here real quick. Okay, so basically this is our Instagram account. Um, our next presentation, as I said, is the psychology of collaboration next week. This one will be 7 p.m. KSA, 8 p.m. UAE. Um, so please do register for the presentation. The registration link is in our bio. So if you click on this link here in our bio, you'll receive um, a link that then takes you to the registration page which you guys have seen already. And then our YouTube account will host all these presentations, including Sir Alto's presentation today, uh, or you may join one of the previous presentations that were, um, that were posted. Of course, including the late Eric Tomic's presentation in Bahrain a couple of years ago, which was a beautiful presentation about his experience with Burj uh, Khalifa in particular, and some of his other projects. Uh, with that, everyone, thank you very much for joining us tonight or today, depending on where you are. And I hope to see you guys all next week. Please do register for the presentation. Mr. Alto, thank you again very much. Any final words? Um, no, thank you, Ali, for, for putting up with the time schedule. <laughs> and uh, thanks for all the excellent questions you know, from, the, from the participants. And thank you so much for, for listening and for attending tonight. Um, it's, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great and wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you.